Welcome to Jackson Hospital's Nursing Student Orientation. The module will proceed with the narration. You must view the entire module. Use the toolbar at the bottom of the screen to navigate through the module. For example, to rewind to the beginning of the module, to pause the module, or to go back one screen at a time. If you have a question or need help with computer issues or volume, please ask your facilitator. The Jackson Hospital Nursing Student Orientation will cover the following topics. Introduction to Jackson Hospital, General Safety, Infection Control, HIPAA, Patient Safety, Age-Specific and Cultural Diversity, HCAPs and Customer Service, Advanced Directives and Code Status, Clinical Rotation Guidelines, and Points to Remember. This module lasts approximately one hour and 15 minutes. Hello, I'm Ellen Justice, Academic Coordinator for the Education Department at Jackson Hospital. I would like to welcome you to your clinical rotation at Jackson. I hope you have a rewarding learning experience. You will receive a student packet as part of your clinical orientation. It will contain information and forms for you to complete. The following items will need to be returned to your instructor before coming to the hospital. The completed student general orientation checklist, the signed confidentiality agreement, and your vehicle information, including the make, model, and year of your car that you'll be driving, your vehicle color, and the vehicle tag number or license plate number. When you come to the hospital for your clinical rotation, bring the quick review guide and parking map. First, let's take an overview of the nursing student policy. Appearance. Appearance should be appropriate for Jackson Hospital working environment, which includes a neat, clean, and pressed appearance. Excessive perfume or excessive jewelry are not permitted. You must abide by school and hospital-wide policy for appearance. Identification. Student ID badges should be worn at all times. The badge should be visible on the upper, outermost garment. Regarding attendance, you should report to work on time, complete your entire shift as scheduled, and obtain approval prior to any change. The discipline policy facilitates compliance with Jackson Hospital policies. It follows progressive disciplinary process unless it is a serious violation that warrants immediate termination. Sexual harassment. Jackson Hospital fosters an environment free of sexual harassment. Report any harassment to your instructor or manager. In the event of an on-the-job injury, notify your instructor of the injury. Complete an event report on the Internet which will notify human resources. Seek treatment. If the injury is an emergency, go to the emergency department for treatment. If it is a non-emergency, follow up with your instructor. Jackson Hospital information is available on the hospital Internet by clicking on the Internet Explore icon on the computer desktop. Jackson Hospital policies are available on the hospital Internet by going to the Policies drop-down menu. Jackson Hospital has a mission statement and a vision statement to guide us in all aspects of our care. Jackson Hospital is a not-for-profit organization committed to improving the health of all members of our community by providing superior, patient-centered, and cost-effective health care in a safe, compassionate environment. Our vision is to be Central Alabama's first choice for health care. We work to achieve our mission and vision by following our hospital values. These values include compassion, diversity, education, innovation, integrity, quality, safety, and teamwork. Jackson Hospital maps and guides are available to you on the Jackson Hospital Internet under Reference Library under Maps and Guides. Jackson Hospital is a tobacco-free campus. Students, employees, guests, or visitors will not be allowed to use tobacco products on campus. Students, employees, guests, or visitors that choose to smoke will have to leave the campus because no smoking is allowed on the hospital property, including vehicles parked on property. This map indicates the Jackson Hospital tobacco-free zone and student parking. Tobacco use is prohibited inside the red zone. Student parking is permitted only in the parking lot behind the Jackson Imaging Center. Shuttle service is available to and from the lot 24-7 by dialing 293-8007. Students are required to have a Jackson Hospital parking tag visible. Place the parking tag in your windshield in the upper corner of the driver's side. Violations to Jackson Hospital's parking policy include lack of visible parking decal, 
parking in unauthorized areas, parking on streets on or adjacent to Jackson Hospital's campus. After a first violation, the employee will receive a written citation. After a second violation within a year, the employee will receive a written citation, immobilization of their vehicle, the department director will be notified. After a third violation, the employee will be issued a citation, immobilization, a $75 fine to remove the immobilization, and will have a meeting between department director and vice president. After a fourth violation, the vehicle will be towed and notification of the department director and vice president. The hospital entrances have access control. The hospital is locked between 9 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. The front entrance is locked between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. The emergency department lobby has 24-hour access. The control access system has two types of keypad entries. The first one is a swipe keypad access control. These keypads are located at the main hospital entrances. The second type is a prox fob keypad access control. This type of keypad is located on the emergency and radiology department entrances. Essential staff for these areas including ED staff, radiology, respiratory, lab phlebotomist, pharmacy, will be issued the JH Prox ID card. Check with your supervisor or with security on how to use these keypads. If you have questions about hospital security, the parking policy, or access control, please contact the security department. The security department mans a monitor room next to the emergency department waiting room. It is manned 24 hours. You can reach the monitor room by dialing 293-8007 or extension 5918. The security department also has an office on the first floor of the South Building behind Human Resources. It can be reached by dialing 293-8693. Terry Reed is the director of the security department he can be reached at extension 8693. The security department offers the following services. Courtesy vans to vehicles, which is available to visitors and employees. Jump starting vehicles. Unlocking vehicles. Securing valuables for patients. Accessing the hospital after hours. To request these services, contact the security department at 293-8007. Be alert when going to and from your car. Secure valuables in your vehicle trunk. Contact security for any suspicious persons. Always wear your ID badge. It is required to enter the hospital in case of disaster. Metal detection equipment is located and metal screenings are done at the entrance to the emergency department. The purpose of this is to provide increased security for the hospital. No weapons are permitted in the facility. I want to take this opportunity to educate you on an important topic that concerns all employees at Jackson Hospital. The topic is back safety and body mechanics. Body mechanics is the science of motion or position of the body. You can utilize appropriate body mechanics and ergonomic strategies to improve your job performance by creating an efficient workspace, work with appropriate posture, and avoid unnecessary injury. Back injuries are one of the leading causes of missed days from work and work-related injuries and one of the largest challenges healthcare providers face today. Recent research suggests that providing education concerning appropriate posture and body mechanics helps prevent work-related injuries. Proper lifting techniques are important in order to prevent back injuries such as sprains to ligaments, strains to muscles, bulging and herniation to vertebral discs. The spine is able to sustain a great amount of force when aligned properly with proper posture. But when used inefficiently and out of proper posture, injuries can occur. The illustration to the left shows the person lifting a box using the back as a lever and as a result could cause herniation of the vertebral disc, which provides shock absorption for the forces placed on the spine. Back injuries occur from improper lifting but can also occur from pulling objects versus pushing objects such as a cart or dolly. Pushing objects allows us to maintain an appropriate neutral spine posture and produce maximum amount of force. Pulling objects can cause us to lose our neutral spine posture and therefore causing our muscles to work inefficiently. 
An important principle to remember is that for every one pound that we lift exerts 10 pounds of force on the spine. Injuries can occur from static sitting for long periods of time due to computer-based work environments. This applies to business personnel, inputting data, and clinical personnel during documentation. Proper lifting technique requires you to spread your legs hip width apart to provide a good base of support and balance, keeping your back in a neutral position from beginning, lifting from floor to standing, keeping the object close to your body at all times. When you lift objects from the floor or move them down to the floor, you should feel the muscles in your legs working more. When turning, always turn your feet in the direction you will be taking the object and avoid fixing your feet to the floor and twisting your back. All personnel should utilize this technique to avoid bending or twisting your back because muscles work inefficiently once the spine moves out of the neutral position, placing you at risk for injury. Some ways to prevent back injuries while sitting. Limit your time sitting to one and a half hours, then plan to stand momentarily stretching your back into extension to decompress your spine. Avoid a slumping posture by setting up your workstation to better serve you. You can work on proper posture by lifting your chest, drawing your abdominal muscles inward, holding for 10 seconds for 10 repetitions throughout the day. Be careful not to hold your breath as proper breathing is important. This could lead to a positive habit and prevent back injury in the future. Safety management. Hospital safety management involves ways to maintain a safe physical environment by ongoing hazard surveillance. It involves adhering to hospital-wide and departmental safety policies and procedures. It also involves preventing injury and investigating injuries if they occur. The hospital is also involved in risk assessment to reduce the incidences of back injuries, needle sticks, and blood and body fluid exposures. Electrical safety. There are several guidelines that should be followed in order to establish electrical safety. Extension cords, adapters, and multiple outlets should not be used in patient care areas. Immediately report frayed cords, broken plugs, loose or broken electrical outlets for repair. Electrical devices brought in from outside the hospital must be checked by facilities management or biomedical prior to use. Preventative maintenance is done on hospital equipment. Equipment must be maintained at least once a year, except for defibrillators, which must be maintained every six months. Emergency power. Specially marked red outlets are emergency power outlets and work on generator power in the case of an emergency. All life support and essential equipment should be connected to the emergency power outlets in case of a power outage. Red electrical outlets are for life support equipment only. Medical equipment. Medical equipment may include IV pumps, feeding pumps, blood pressure monitors, infant warmers, fetal heart monitors, medication and syringe pumps, cardiac monitors, and ventilators. Students must be familiar with equipment used in the hospital on their clinical unit. Review equipment with your nursing instructor. Ask for assistance if necessary. To ensure equipment safety, do not use malfunctioning equipment. Make sure to tag it as defective and remove it from the work area. Report all shocks during use of equipment. If a metal device is connected to the death, serious injury, or serious illness of an individual, the Safe Medical Devices Act is a federal law that requires it to be reported within 10 days. If an injury occurs while using any equipment, notify your instructor for follow-up with the appropriate hospital personnel. Radiation there are two types of radiation, X-rays and radioactive sources. Both types of radiation present a hazard. X-rays are like light bulbs. The radiation hazard does not exist unless the exposure switch is on. Radioactive sources are like a flame. The radiation hazard diminishes over time and cannot be turned off and on. X-rays are only a hazard when the exposure is being made. There are precautions to follow in order to avoid overexposure to radiation. Ask visitors and staff to step outside of the room during an X-ray exposure. Announce to those in the immediate area that an exposure is about to be made. If possible, do not hold the patient during an X-ray exposure. A radiation hazard can be present when radioactive material is put inside a patient's body for nuclear medicine studies or cancer treatments. 
A radiation hazard sign is posted on a room door if a patient in the room poses a threat to others. Do not enter a patient's room that has been posted as a radiation hazard unless you are the primary caregiver. Make sure you follow precautions if entering. Students are not assigned to these patients. Staff members and students in designated departments will be required to wear a film badge to monitor radiation exposure over time. Protect yourself from radiation exposure by limiting the time you're exposed to radiation, keeping as much distance as possible between you and the source of radiation, and utilizing shielding as much as possible by wearing lead apparel or closing the door. If you have questions about radiation hazards, contact the Radiation Safety Office with questions or concerns at extension 8180. Hazardous Materials If there is a hazardous material spill, these are the actions that you should take. Attempt to contain the spill. Notify your instructor and housekeeping. Read the label on the container for the product name and the caution and warning information. Obtain appropriate material safety data sheet. Ask staff members to assist you if needed. To access the material safety data sheets, go to the Internet home page. On the left-hand menu, you will find the selection. Starting in December 2013, material safety data sheets will be referred to as safety data sheets. For the new safety data sheets, standardized labels will be required. These labels will include the following information, the product and chemical identifier, supplier information, a standardized hazard pictogram, a signal word of danger or warning indicating the level of severity of the hazard, a hazard statement or statements, precautionary information. The new standardized hazard pictograms will appear as shown. On the Internet, you can also find the Utility User Manual by going to Policies and then the Environment of Care Plans. The Utility User Manual explains how to safely use the utilities of the hospital, including electrical equipment and electric systems. These systems include electrical, telephones, water, medical gases, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, nurse call system, PA system, sewer lines and elevators. Emergency codes. To report a code or to have an emergency code announced over the PA system, always dial extension 8222. By using this extension, the hospital operator will immediately pick up the extension. You will not have to wait on hold. Give the operator the necessary information about the code and make sure to tell her the location of the code. The codes that are used at Jackson Hospital include the following. Code 99 is used for a cardiac or respiratory arrest. The operator will announce this code and a location three times. If it is a pediatric cardiac or respiratory arrest, make sure to tell the operator Code 99P. Code 99P will be announced so that the response team will know to bring a pediatric crash cart. ICE Team ICE stands for In Case of Emergency. The ICE team is called when a patient's condition is rapidly deteriorating. This multidisciplinary team responds to these urgent patient situations. The goal is to provide rapid intervention in order to prevent the patient from having a Code 99. Code 88 is for a possible stroke. The Code 88 team responds. Code pink or code 11 is announced for an infant or child abduction. In the event of a code pink, time is the most critical factor. As part of your departmental orientation, find out your role in your department for the code pink response. Code 3 is announced when an individual becomes disorderly or unmanageable and seems to be posing a threat to self or others and who cannot be managed by the hospital staff members that are present. Security responds to provide assistance and employ nonviolent crisis intervention techniques to control the individual. Code Silver is announced when a disorderly person is armed with a weapon and possibly intends to harm someone or take hostages. Staff members in the immediate area should clear the hallway of patients, visitors, and staff. Seek shelter and remain out of public view until the all clear is announced. Security will respond to the scene immediately to evaluate and stabilize the situation. Additional emergency codes include Mr. Red or Code 22, which indicates the presence of fire, smoke, or fire odor. 
Review the safety manual to find out your proper response to a fire in your department or a fire in another part of the hospital. Additional screens will present more information about fire safety. Code 33 is for tornado warning. It is announced any time there's a tornado warning issued from the National Weather Service indicating there's a tornado in the area and the hospital is in its path. Return to your department to follow your departmental guidelines to protect patients, visitors, and employees in the designated locations and in the appropriate manner. Code 44 indicates an influx of trauma patients to the emergency department. Designated staff members will be requested to report to the department. Code 66 is the disaster code. It is announced in the case of an internal disaster in the hospital or an external disaster in the community. In the case of a disaster, the command center is in the conference room outside the finance department on the second floor of the south building. During a disaster, we follow the protocols of the hospital incident command system. Find out from your supervisor your response during a code 66. Code 77 is for a code walker. It is announced for patient elopement when a patient has purposefully or inadvertently wandered off and left the unit. When a patient is noted missing, the staff member should dial 8222 and have the switchboard operator announce code walker and the unit. Security personnel will begin looking for the patient and following the proper protocols. Code 1 is for a bomb threat. Fire prevention. Information about fire prevention will include three aspects, protecting patients, staff, and visitors from fire and smoke, maintaining fire protection systems, investigating fire protection deficiencies to provide better prevention in the future. You need to be aware of the fire plan. This is actions or things to do in case of fire. If there is a fire in your area, use the RACE acronym R. Rescue anyone in danger. A. Alarm. Pull fire alarm and call the emergency number 8222 to notify operator and state the location. C. Close all doors to confine the fire. E. Extinguish the fire or evacuate as necessary. Oxygen cutoff is only done after directed by a supervisor to do so. If you are away from your work area, return to your work area to provide assistance and to be accounted for. If the fire is in another area, close all doors, calm patients and visitors, prepare to respond if the fire and smoke threatens your area, always use the stairs in case of fire, not the elevator. Know the location and types of fire extinguishers in your area. Most fire extinguishers in the hospital can be used for all types of fires. Fire extinguishers should never be used on people unless as a last resort. Emergency management is a plan to provide an effective response in disasters. These can be natural or man-made disasters. These include but are not limited to tornadoes, bomb threat, or mass casualty incidents. Emergency management drills are conducted regularly. Students may be asked to participate in drills. Tornado warning. During severe weather, hospital personnel monitor the weather and will implement a tornado warning. A code 33. Know the hospital's procedure for severe weather. Move ambulatory patients to center hallways away from glass and windows. Have patients sit on floor or in a sturdy chair against a wall with a pillow to shield their heads from flying debris. Non-ambulatory patients remain in bed with the bed moved away from windows. Visitors are directed to a waiting area as outlined in the tornado plan. Close all blinds, drapes, and doors. Maintain passage on one side of the hallway. Bomb threat. If the bomb threat comes from a phone call, keep the caller online as long as possible. Try to determine information about the caller. Age, sex, nationality, background noises. Is the caller a former employee or patient? Do not hang up the phone until directed by security. Have a coworker notify the hospital operator immediately by dialing the emergency number 8222. She will announce the code for a bomb threat, code 1. Employees should be aware of suspicious items that might contain a bomb. Security will respond to the location. The event report system ensures that proper records and documentation are collected when events occur. Event reports are not part of the medical record. Categories of events include anesthesia, blood, clinical intervention, environment. Environmental events include damage to the facility, security events, theft. Categories also include falls, injury, medical error, 
miscellaneous, and obstetrics. If you have any questions about how to fill out an event report or when to fill out an event report, please ask your supervisor. Event reports are filed for an occurrence with a patient, visitor, employee, or physician. The employee who is involved in the situation, discovers the situation, or is aware of the event must complete the event report with as many details as possible and notify the supervisor immediately. If you are injured in the hospital, notify your supervisor and follow the proper procedures. In order to maintain a safe working environment in the hospital, staff members, volunteers, and students need to be aware of several types of events or hazards to try to avoid in the workplace. Common types of events that may cause injury include slips, trips, and falls, lifting and repositioning patients, being struck by an object or struck against an object, and bloodborne pathogen exposures. To avoid trips and falls, it is best to keep aisles and floors clear of hazards, to post warning signs or block off wet or slippery floors, to wear proper shoes, and be aware of uneven surfaces and snow and ice. When using electrical devices, remember to adhere to these safety measures. Follow manufacturer's recommendations. Inspect cords, plugs, and insulation for damage before use. All equipment should have three pronged plugs and be grounded. Do not use electrical devices with wet hands or near water. Always use the proper PPE for the given device. Extension cords are not allowed for long-term use. If equipment is defective or overheats, smokes, sparks, or shocks, take it out of service, lock or tag the controls, inform the supervisor. The Safe Medical Devices Act, or SMDA, is a federal regulation that we as a healthcare facility are required to follow. If equipment harms or contributes to the death of a patient or employee, we are required to report it to the supervisor immediately, take the device out of service, complete an event report as soon as possible. Your supervisor will notify biomedical clinical engineering. The hospital is required to report the incident to the FDA within 10 days. Hazardous material and waste. Hazardous material and waste is defined as any substance or chemical which is a physical or health hazard to humans, animals, plants, and the environment. This includes hazardous chemicals, chemotherapy drugs, infectious materials, and radioactive materials. According to the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RCRA, facilities are required to track hazardous material and waste from their creation to their disposal or from what is called cradle to grave. Symbols are often used to indicate the type of health hazard that exists with a hazardous material. There are three ways to protect yourself from these hazards, following administrative controls, following engineering controls, and using personal protective equipment. Waste segregation. Why do we segregate our waste at Jackson Hospital? The reason is that the cost of processing infectious waste is seven times higher than processing regular or non-infectious waste. Also, the amount of waste generated at Jackson Hospital exceeds the capacity of the steam sterilizer and rotoclave. There are two types of waste. First, we'll discuss non-infectious waste. Non-infectious waste is trash that does not contain blood or infectious body fluids. Examples include office paper, garbage from food, ashes. Non-infectious waste also includes body excretions such as feces, nasal discharge, saliva, urine, sweat, tears, sputum, or vomit unless they are visibly contaminated with blood. Non-infectious waste is placed in white trash bags and in regular trash bins. The second type of waste is biomedical waste, or it is also known as infectious waste. Biomedical waste includes any solid or liquid which may pose a threat of infection to humans. Examples include body parts and tissues, discarded sharps, blood and blood products, body fluids, and microbiological waste. It also includes any material saturated to the point of dripping with blood or body fluids. Biomedical waste or infectious waste is placed in red trash bags and red biomedical waste containers. When disposing of biomedical waste, red bags must be properly sealed. Do not fill bags more than three quarters full. Twist the neck of the bag tightly and tie it in a knot or use a plastic tie strip. 
For safe biomedical waste disposal, follow these reminders. Always wear gloves when handling biomedical waste. Always carry waste away from your body. When transferring biomedical waste, keep one hand free of glove to open doors, etc. Place sealed red bags into large biohazard bins. Welcome to the infection control section of Jackson Hospital's general orientation module. The purpose of this module is to educate new staff about infection prevention and to inform you of your responsibilities in helping to create a safe medical community for our patients and our staff. Jackson Hospital has infection control policies located on the Jackson Hospital intranet. To access the policies, click Policies on the home page. Then follow the drop-down to the Infection Control section where you will see all available policies. The goal of our infection control program is to prevent and control infections among our patients as well as our staff and visitors. We accomplish this through providing education, following CDC guidelines for infection control, and by always using a continuous team approach for preventing infections. Remember, infection control is everyone's business. As part of infection control, staff members and students need to be aware of the impact of nosocomial infections, which are also referred to as healthcare-associated infections or hospital-acquired infections, HAIs. HAIs are the fourth leading actual cause of death in the United States. HAIs can extend the hospital stay up to seven days. And one case of an HAI can cost a hospital more than $37,000 per case. Do your part as it relates to preventing the spread of communicable diseases. Students who develop a communicable disease must report it to the clinical instructor. Examples include conjunctivitis, influenza, chickenpox, or a sore throat. Here are some guidelines to follow regarding respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Instruct patients and visitors to cover their mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing. Have tissues available for containment of respiratory secretions. Perform hand hygiene after all contact with respiratory secretions. Healthcare workers should wear a mask within three feet of someone who is coughing or when caring for patients with known or suspected respiratory illness. Offer masks to persons coughing or to persons accompanying them. How do we prevent hospital-acquired infections? The most effective way is by frequent and diligent hand hygiene. Hand washing is considered the single most important procedure for preventing infections. Studies show that hand hygiene compliance in healthcare facilities in the U.S. is not good, only about 40 to 60 percent. Here at Jackson, we have a hand hygiene compliance program where we measure our staff compliance using secret observers. We have found that our compliance is usually around 90 percent. It is important to remember to be very visible when doing hand hygiene because patients, families, and staff may be watching. At Jackson, we follow the CDC hand hygiene guidelines that were published in 2002. These guidelines contain four important sections, hand washing with soap and water, decontamination using alcohol sanitizers, nail condition, and lotions. Make sure to follow the proper hand hygiene guidelines after contact with patients' intact skin, after contact with environmental services in patients' immediate vicinity, including the equipment, after glove removal. While in the hospital, use only approved hand lotions. Hand lotions are not allowed to be brought from home. Do not wear artificial nails or extenders when having direct contact with patients. Hand washing with soap and water. The purpose is to physically remove soil and transient microorganisms, including spores. You should always wash your hands with soap and water when your hands are visibly dirty or have been contaminated with blood, body fluids, or other proteinaceous material before eating or handling food and after using the restroom. Hand washing with soap and water is also required after providing care to C. diff patients. The correct procedure for washing hands with soap and water is basically a five-step procedure. First, wet your hands. Apply soap. Rub hands vigorously for at least 15 seconds, covering all surfaces of hands and fingers. Rinse hands well with water. Dry hands with a paper towel and use the paper towel to turn off the faucet. 
It is important to remember to follow this procedure exactly so that you will get credit for it from our secret observers. Decontaminating your hands with our alcohol sanitizers is quicker and easier. The purpose of alcohol sanitizers is to reduce bacteria on hands that are not visibly soiled. Jackson Hospital has alcohol sanitizers located throughout the hospital. They are to be used in between hand washing with soap and water. Alcohol sanitizers should be used when your hands are not visibly dirty. Before and after direct patient contact. Before applying and after removing gloves. Before starting IVs. Inserting catheters or other medical devices. When moving from a contaminated body site to a clean body site and after contact with objects in a patient's room. Apply the sanitizer to your hands, rubbing your hands together, covering all surfaces until your hands are dry. Nail condition. Remember to keep your nails short. Length of nail tips should be a quarter of an inch or less. No artificial nails or acrylic extenders are allowed in direct patient care areas. Most hospital departments do allow nail polish but it must be in good condition. Because of frequent hand hygiene, it is common for staff to experience dry skin. For this reason, Jackson Hospital provides lotion to help improve skin condition. All of our skin care products must be tested for compatibility with our hand hygiene products. Therefore, we ask that you do not bring lotions from home. Infection control also involves the prevention of the spread of bloodborne pathogens. Hepatitis B and Hepatitis C are bloodborne pathogens that can attack the liver and can cause active hepatitis, which is a flu-like illness that can last for months. It can also cause chronic carrier state hepatitis, where a person may have no symptoms but can pass active hepatitis B virus to others. It can also cause cirrhosis, liver cancer, and death. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, causes AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. HIV attacks the immune system, making the body less able to fight off infections. In most cases, these infections may eventually cause death. Other diseases caused by bloodborne pathogens include syphilis and malaria. According to the Alabama Infected Healthcare Worker Act, any HIV or hepatitis B infected healthcare worker who performs invasive procedures must notify the Director of Infection Control of the Alabama Department of Public Health of his or her infections. Bloodborne pathogens can be spread when infected fluids enter the body through needle stick injuries, cuts, scrapes, or other breaks in the skin, oral, vaginal, or anal sex, sharing infected drug needles. Pregnant women infected with hepatitis or HIV can pass the infection to their babies. As part of the bloodborne pathogen standard, which went into effect in 1992, healthcare facilities must develop an exposure control plan. This includes engineering controls, which includes equipment that isolates or removes the bloodborne pathogen hazard from the workplace. New safety products are continually evaluated. Examples include retractable IV catheters, safety needles, ventilation systems, and sharps containers. The exposure control plan includes work practice controls, actions by employees and students which minimize their exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Examples include hand washing, placing contaminated sharps in appropriate containers, following the policy of no eating or drinking where there is a potential for exposure. It also includes use of personal protective equipment, equipment provided to protect employees and students from possible exposure. This includes gloves, gowns, masks, face shields, and goggles. The exposure control plan includes housekeeping measures, which include ways of maintaining a clean and sanitary condition in our facility to minimize possible exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Examples include proper disposal of regulated waste, cleaning schedules, proper cleanup of spills. The exposure control plan includes post-exposure procedures, what to do if you're exposed to blood, body fluids, or needle stick. Treat all blood, body fluids as infectious. Report any exposure to blood or body fluids immediately. Notify your clinical instructor immediately. Complete quality, occurrence, or event reports. Contact your clinical instructor to assess the injury and arrange medical care as appropriate. If necessary, students may be referred to the emergency department for evaluation and treatment. 
The OSHA Safety Device Act of 2001 required hospitals to implement safety devices in order to reduce sharps injuries. Jackson Hospital has implemented many safety devices since then. Examples include safety IV catheters, needles and lancets, needleless IV tubing and access devices, and plastic blood tubes. Devices vary between departments, so make sure you are trained on how to use the safety devices that are specific to your job duties. Remember that one of the most important safety rules is to never recap a dirty needle with the original cover. Always activate the safety device before disposing of needles. All needles and other sharps are to be disposed of in a hard-sided sharps container, never in a regular trash can. Wall unit sharps containers are located in all patient rooms and at nursing stations. Some departments also have floor model sharps containers. Linen. Clean linen is kept in the clean utility rooms on all nursing units. The large bins contain fabric covers which must be down in order to protect the clean linen from dust. All linen that goes into a patient room is considered soiled, whether or not it is actually used. Only carry linen into a room if you anticipate using it. Once linen is soiled, handle it as little as possible. Carry it away from your body. Do not lay it down on the floor or on furniture. Soiled linen is disposed of in hampers containing disposable plastic bags. These bags are to be tied and placed into large linen bins in the soiled utility rooms on each unit. Universal precautions, now known as standard precautions, is the concept that all patients are potentially infectious. And healthcare workers need to take precautions to avoid skin and mucous membrane exposure when contacting blood or body fluids. Personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is always available for staff to use. Jackson provides gloves in various sizes, two types of protective gowns, masks, safety glasses, and face shields. Choose the appropriate PPE according to the type of task that you are doing. Standard precautions applies to all patients. Occasionally, patients are placed on isolation precautions in addition to standard precautions based on their diagnosis or suspected disease or condition. There are three main types of isolation precautions, all designed to help protect staff and visitors from possible exposure to infectious microorganisms. They are contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. Contact precautions is the most common type of isolation precautions. You will see an orange door sign on the patient's room. This sign indicates the PPE that is appropriate for this type of isolation. You will need to wear gloves and a gown into these rooms, and possibly a surgical mask if the task you are doing involves being near the patient's face. These patients need to be placed in a private room. Examples include MRSA, VRE, scabies, C. difficile, diarrhea, incontinence, uncontrolled draining wounds, and shingles. Droplet precautions is another type of isolation precautions. The door sign indicating droplet precautions is green. It is very important to always wear gloves, gown, and a surgical mask into these rooms. Patients on droplet isolation will be assigned to a private room and the door should remain closed at all times. Examples include influenza, mycoplasm pneumonia, strep pharyngitis or pneumonia. Airborne precautions is the third type of isolation precautions designed to protect staff and visitors. The door sign is blue. Again, gloves are required on entry. It is not a CDC requirement to wear a gown into these rooms since the exposure risk is airborne and not based on contact transmission. However, it is still a good idea to wear a gown when contact with the patient is anticipated. A special type of mask called an N95 particulate respirator is a requirement for staff entering the room of a patient on this type of isolation. You must be fit tested for this mask upon employment and then annually thereafter. Patients on airborne precautions will be placed into a negative pressure room where the air from the room cannot escape into the hallway as long as the door is closed. There are two negative pressure rooms on most units. Examples include disseminated zoster, chickenpox, measles, 
hemorrhagic fevers, and other infectious diseases requiring an N95 mask, such as TB, smallpox, and SARS. Students are not allowed in airborne precaution rooms. There is a fourth type of isolation precautions, but this one is designed for the protection of the patient. It is called immunocompromised or neutropenic precautions. Patients who are immunocompromised due to cancer or AIDS-related illness will be placed on this type of isolation. Examples include leukemia, patients receiving cancer therapy, some HIV patients, and patients with low platelet counts, and if physician ordered. These patients have some special restrictions. They are placed in a private room. Visitation is limited to people who have not been sick recently. They cannot have uncooked food, fresh fruit, fresh flowers, or potted plants. The door sign shown can be printed from the Jackson Hospital intranet. Always remember that hand hygiene is the most important thing you can do to protect yourself and others from infections. Patient safety is in your hands, so please keep washing them. Hello, my name is Andrea Sanders and I am the Director of Health Information Management and the Privacy Officer for Jackson Hospital and Clinic. Today I am going to discuss the topic HIPAA Guidelines for Confidentiality, Privacy, and Security. Protect the patient, the hospital, and yourself. All of our patients have a legal right to privacy. Any information disclosed by a patient to a physician, clinician, or healthcare worker should be held in the strictest confidence. Every patient treated at Jackson Hospital and Clinic has a legal right to privacy, regardless of the types of services received. It is the responsibility of every employee to protect this right. Now let's discuss HIPAA. What is HIPAA? HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA establishes national standards for the privacy of protected health information, which is referred to as PHI. HIPAA also establishes regulations that address the assessing and handling of patients' identifiable and medical information, whether it is spoken, written, or electronic. HIPAA states healthcare workers should protect the privacy of their patients, should only disclose information to those who need to know and may disclose information for TPO, the patient's treatment, payment, and the hospital's operational purposes. Some of you may be wondering by now, why was HIPAA created? HIPAA was created to improve the portability and continuity of health insurance. HIPAA was also created to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse in the healthcare industry. Finally, HIPAA was created to establish federal mandates for the protection of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of personal health information. HIPAA actually includes two parts, a privacy and a security rule. The privacy rule is enforced by the Office of Civil Rights of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. What is the HIPAA Privacy Rule? The HIPAA Privacy Rule protects the privacy of patients by limiting the way personal health information can be used, by requiring the security of health records in paper, electronic, and other forms, and lastly, by notifying patients about their rights. The privacy rule protects PHI, which is protected health information. PHI is individually identifiable health information held or transmitted in any form or media. PHI includes demographic data that relates to the patient's past, present, or future physical health or mental condition, past, present, or future health care services provided to the individual, and past, present, or future payment for those health care services. Examples include the patient's name, address, date of birth, social security number, diagnoses, test results, and admission and discharge dates. The HIPAA privacy rule addresses patients' individual rights, use and disclosure of protected health information, minimum necessary, and policies, procedures, and documentation. Patients' privacy rights. An individual has the right to receive 
a notice of privacy practice, amend and correct PHI, receive an accounting or audit of disclosures, request a restriction as to how PHI is used or disclosed, request confidential communication or communication in an alternative means. For example, leaving a message on a cell phone versus someone's home phone. Also, mailing information to a post office box versus mailing information to a home address. An individual also has the right to file a complaint with the hospital's privacy officer or the Office of Civil Rights. How do we protect a patient's privacy? When patient information is requested, send the patient or others to the Health Information Management Department for proper disclosures. Obtain authorizations from the patient or the patient's legal guardian unless required by state or federal law, such as through subpoena, court order, or state and federal agencies. Minors and patients' privacy. In the state of Alabama, only birth parents or those listed on guardianship papers can access a minor's information. In Alabama, a minor 14 years of age or older or who meets the following criteria may consent to medical, dental, health, or mental services for themselves. These criteria include if he or she has graduated from high school or is married or has been married or divorced or is pregnant. If a minor requests health care without the parent's consent, then the minor's privacy should be protected under the HIPAA privacy rule. This means that a minor must give permission before information is given to a parent. Minimum necessary. The privacy rule addresses the minimum necessary standard or disclosure of information only when there is a need to know. Need to know means access only the information you need, Use this information only to do your job and limit the information you share with individuals to what they need to know in order to perform their jobs. Earlier in the presentation, I told you that HIPAA has two parts, a privacy rule and a security rule. What is the HIPAA security rule? The HIPAA security rule protects only PHI or protected health information that is created, maintained, received, or transmitted electronically. This includes information that is transmitted over the Internet, stored on a computer, CD, a magnetic disk, magnetic tape, or related means. To protect the electronic transmission of data, always send emails, faxes, and data transfers over a secure network. Always use cover sheets marked confidential when faxing. Limit the faxing and emailing of health information. Always verify fax numbers, telephone numbers, and email addresses. Wrongful Disclosure Employees should access PHI or protected health information only if it is needed in the performance of their duties or jobs or for continued patient care. Employees can be terminated for accidentally or wrongfully disclosing, receiving, or transmitting PHI. Employees may also be subject to civil and criminal penalties if health information is wrongfully disclosed. Case study related to misplaced or lost information. To avoid a breach of confidentiality, do not take medical records off the unit or premises without a supervisor's permission. You must de-identify PHI for use other than health care operation purposes. That means mark through any identifying information with a thick black marker. Case study. Handling requests for patient information. If a guest or visitor asks for patient information, what information are you allowed to give out? If privacy is not indicated, then general information can be given out including the patient room number, the patient room phone number, and the patient's general condition. If privacy is indicated, then all you can say is, I have no information on this patient. If a patient has indicated privacy, document in the chart what type of permission the patient has consented to. In some situations, the use of a password is used to allow family members to get information about a privacy patient. Penalties for HIPAA violations. The federal government can impose penalties on the hospital and individuals. The smaller penalties are usually for failure to comply, while the serious penalties are for wrongful disclosures of PHI. 
Civil fines can amount to a maximum of $100 per person per violation and a maximum of $25,000 for repeated violations in the same year. Criminal penalties for deliberate misuse of PHI can incur a $50,000 to $250,000 fine along with 1 to 10 years imprisonment. These are basic HIPAA reminders. Do not place PHI in regular trash cans. Dispose of it in shred bins. They're located throughout the hospital. Do not discuss PHI with the patient's family members, friends, or visitors unless the patient has approved the disclosure. Do not discuss PHI in public areas such as hallways, elevators, or cafeteria. Do not discuss any PHI outside the workplace or after hours. Do not take pictures of patients or PHI with cell phones or other devices. Do not post or discuss PHI on social media sites such as Facebook, MySpace, and Twitter. Do not view the PHI of family, friends, or your own records unless it is required for the performance of your duties or job. You can be personally liable. Therefore, if you have any questions about how to follow HIPAA guidelines or regulations in your job, contact your supervisor or the privacy officer at extension 8907. As part of our quality and regulatory compliance efforts, we are accredited by the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission accredits and certifies healthcare organizations across the United States. Jackson Hospital's Joint Commission accreditation is a symbol of quality that reflects our commitment to meeting certain performance standards. The hospital is surveyed every three years to ensure compliance with Joint Commission standards. However, we are subject to surveys at any time. The Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals each year, the Joint Commission establishes national patient safety goals that hospitals must adhere to to receive their accreditation. The purpose of these goals is to improve patient safety. The goals focus on problems in healthcare safety and how to solve them. Identify patients correctly. Use at least two ways to identify patients. Eliminate blood transfusion errors by confirming correct patient and correct blood type. Improve staff communication. Get important test results to the right staff person on time. Use medication safely. Label all medicines. Take extra care with blood thinning medicines. Make sure patients know which medicine to take when they are at home. Tell the patient to bring a list of medicines when they visit a doctor. Prevent infection. Follow the CDC hand cleaning guidelines. Use proven guidelines to prevent infections. Use safe practices to treat the part of the body where surgery was done. Use proven guidelines to prevent urinary tract infections caused by catheters. Identify patient safety risks. Find out which patients are at risk of suicide. Follow universal protocol to prevent mistakes in surgery. Preventing wrong site, wrong procedure, wrong person. Mark the site of the procedure. Perform a pre-procedure verification timeout. Medication administration. You are responsible for giving the right dose of the right medication by the right route, at the right time, to the right patient, for the right reason, using the right documentation. Remember, always use two patient identifiers, patient name and the medical record number. The Electronic Medication Administration Record You will attend an AdminRx computer class conducted by your instructor for barcode scanning medications and documenting in the Electronic Medication Administration Record, or EMAR. Your instructor will review the EMR with you prior to clinicals. Be sure to chart patient results to all PRN medications. Remember to have your instructor co-sign the EMR. If you have questions, please be sure to ask your instructor or the nursing staff. Documentation. You must chart pertinent information. Follow the facility's charting guidelines. Be familiar with the computer documentation. Training will be scheduled prior to your clinicals. Complete all documentation in a timely manner. Instructors will review your documentation and paperwork and co-sign it. Handoff communication. Staff who are involved in transferring a patient to another care provider should communicate the patient's condition, treatments, procedures, and other pertinent information to the staff receiving the patient. The staff involved must provide an opportunity to ask and respond to questions. 
Examples of handoff communication occur at shift change, temporary coverage of assignments, physician to physician, OR to the unit, floor to the ICU. Universal Protocol The hospital fulfills the expectations set forth in the Universal Protocol. This includes conducting a preoperative verification process, marking the operative site, conducting a timeout immediately before starting the procedure. All staff will verify the five corrects. Correct patient, correct procedure, correct site and side, correct patient position, and the availability of correct equipment or supplies. Core measure sets. Core measure sets are standardized performance measures followed by accredited healthcare organizations. As part of the core measure sets, patients with the following diagnoses have specific orders and guidelines on admission. Core measure sets are established for acute myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, and stroke. CMS reimbursement is based on 100% adherence to these core measure sets. Our goal is 100% for every core measure. The core measures for acute myocardial infarction are shown on this slide. Core measures are subject to changes and additions. The core measures for congestive heart failure include the following, shown here. The core measures for pneumonia include the measures listed here. The core measures for stroke include all of the following listed here. As part of our patient safety plan, we use wristband alerts on the patient's armband. The alerts easily notify all staff members of a patient's status. The yellow alert label indicates the patient is at risk to fall and needs assistance when getting out of the bed. The red alert indicates an allergy to a food or a drug. Purple indicates the patient is a do not resuscitate status. Orange indicates that the patient is on isolation precautions. Green indicates if the patient has a latex allergy. The pink alert indicates that there are restrictions on what extremities can be used for blood pressure monitoring, IVs, and lab draws, etc. Fall prevention. Patients depend on you to keep them safe. Is your patient at risk for a fall? For more information, refer to the Fall Prevention Policy, NUR 506.05, available on the intranet. For fall prevention, the Morse Fall Scale is completed on admission, a change in the patient's condition, and at each shift. Patient at risk identifiers include the yellow wristband alert, the yellow magnet strip on the outside of the door facing, and yellow socks. The new striker beds have patient alarms built into the bed. Healthcare Error Reporting The definition of a healthcare error is anything that is outside the expected or anticipated outcome in the delivery of health care. You will need to complete a report when an actual or potential adverse event occurs or is identified. If you are involved in a health care error, notify your instructor immediately. The instructor will notify the staff and follow appropriate actions. Age-specific and developmentally appropriate care. At each stage of life, human beings exhibit predictable characteristics, needs, developmental challenges, and milestones. It is important to understand and consider each of these factors as you provide developmentally appropriate care for each patient. This type of care involves care, communication, and age-specific customer focus for each patient. According to the Joint Commission standards, a health care provider should be competent in providing developmentally appropriate care. Cultural diversity. America's population is changing rapidly. As well, the diversity of the Montgomery area population is also changing. Healthcare organizations are obligated to provide culturally sensitive care. Language and translation resources are available at all facilities. Cultural diversity, providing culturally sensitive care. We can show respect to our patients and their culture 
by providing care in a way that takes into account each patient's values, beliefs, and practices. Engaging in effective communication with the patient provides insight into the patient's cultural perspective and their understanding of their disease. Providing culturally sensitive care also promotes health and healing. Each nursing unit and the education department has a cultural reference manual available as a resource. If there is a language barrier, remember to use an interpreter. Interpreters are available through the AT&T language line for translation. Check with your supervisor on how to access the language line when necessary. Pay for performance. There are standards that hospitals must meet in order to receive full reimbursement from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. The amount that Jackson Hospital receives is based on our performance related to these standards. They focus on clinical standards of practice and patient satisfaction. These standards include adherence to core measure sets and HCAP surveys measuring perception of patient care. HCAP surveys. HCAP's Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems is a national standardized tool to measure adult inpatient perception of the quality of care they received at a hospital. The survey questions include ways to measure both patient satisfaction and quality. All employees of the hospital and students doing rotations at the hospital can have a positive impact on these survey scores. HCAP surveys and HCAP scores. Jackson Hospital has established benchmarks and goals for all areas measured in the HCAP surveys. The domains and the goal for each domain is shown in the table. At the bottom of the table you can see that our goal for likely to recommend the hospital is 77 percent. Updated scores are available on the Jackson Hospital Internet. The Jackson Team Commitment is a document which contains a set of ideas which were adopted by team members who consisted of employees of the facility to help guide all the staff members in our daily interaction with our patients, visitors, and each other as staff members. These set of standards consist of the following. First, the commitment to our patients. And it says that I will help you feel welcome, safe, and at ease. I will listen to you with kindness and respond quickly to your needs. I will treat you with compassion and respect. I will keep you informed and involved in your care, and I will take action to address your concerns. These are actions that will help all of us to provide superior health care in a safe, compassionate environment. The commitment to my teammates. To my teammates, I will come to work with the right attitude. I will treat my coworkers with respect and professionalism. I will work with you as a team to serve our patients and the community. I will present myself and our organization in its best light. I will be the reason that people choose to come to Jackson Hospital. And this is an effort to ensure that all of our staff members feel like they are in an environment that fosters positive patient care. When using the telephone, don't forget your telephone etiquette. Always focus on your customer. Pause, take a breath, smile. Always say your department, your name, and a friendly greeting. For example, hello, Human Resources, this is Brittany. How may I help you? Advanced Directives In compliance with Alabama law, a patient has the right to accept or refuse treatment and to create an advanced directive. The hospital needs to inform the patient of these rights. Advanced Directive A written set of instructions recognized under state law, such as a living will or durable power of attorney for health care, about the provision of health care when the individual is incapacitated. The hospital is required to ask all inpatients if they have formulated an advance directive. We need to document the location of the advance directive and request a copy for the patient's medical record. Follow the directive after it has taken effect. Code status. Be familiar with code status that may be related to patient care. A no code is by a physician's order only. A DNI is do not intubate. A DNR is do not resuscitate. And the definition of a DNR is where the patient's condition, diagnosis, and prognosis are such that all reasonable and acceptable measures are taken to preserve the life of the patient except attempts to resuscitate the patient in the event of a cardiac or pulmonary arrest. If in doubt about the code status of a patient, code the patient. General Guidelines for Clinical Rotation 
make sure you complete your preclinical experience as required. Follow the clinical rotation guidelines and make sure on days of your clinical rotation to follow all requirements. Remember, smoking is not allowed on the hospital campus. For dress code, faculty and students must dress in accordance with the uniform standards. Wear your name badge so that it is clearly visible at all times. Student observations. Seek opportunities to learn. With permission, students may obtain permission to observe in other departments. For example, following a patient for an EGD in endoscopy. During your clinical rotation, remember to follow the facilities guidelines. Ask questions when you don't know the answer. Seek out staff to help you with your learning experience. Report abnormal findings to your instructor and the patient's nurse. Be sure to give report on your patient at the end of the shift. Be familiar with the hospital environment and know proper emergency procedures. Seek opportunities to learn. Think safety first. Some points to remember. The patient is the purpose of our work. Provide excellent patient care. Be courteous to patients and family members. Keep noise levels down. Always identify yourself. Please respect the privacy of our patients. There are references and resources available for you. On the Jackson Hospital intranet, you will find the Infection Control Manual and the Safety Manual. You will also find the MSDS information, as well as Jackson Hospital policies and procedures. If you search the internet, you'll find the National Patient Safety Goals by visiting the Joint Commission site at www.jointcommission.org. You'll also find the Safe Medical Device Act of 1990 and the Alabama Infected Healthcare Worker Act. This is the end of the Nursing Student Orientation Module. Please submit the required paperwork to your instructor. We hope you have a great learning experience.